Hi, my name is Methat El Masri. In today's video, I will show you how to develop database driven application in Razor Pages using Code First development. We will use Visual Studio Code for our editor. The data model will be based on a team player relationship in sports. We will use SQL Server running in a Docker container. Let's get started. Let's first create a Razor Pages app in .NET. Now I have .NET 6.0 installed on my machine as you can see I can go .NET and version and you will see that I've got 6.0.400 I will create a new Razor Pages application by typing .NET new Razor and the output directory is going to be team players. So at this point, the app was created so I can go into the team player directory and run the application. I'll do that with .NET watch run. This is what the application looks like. In order to use SQL Server with our Razor Pages application, we will need to install three NuGet packages. So I'm going to stop my server at this point and we'll install the three required NuGet packages and they are .NET add package and the first one is Microsoft dot entity framework core. That's my first package. The second one is the same name like before. We're going to add to it SQL Server and the third one one, instead of SQL Server, we're going to add tools. Now there is one more package that we'll need because we're going to use the code generator utility. So let us install the code generation NuGet package. So I'm going to add package Microsoft dot Visual Studio dot Web dot code generation dot design. Now there are two tools that we also need. The first tool is the .NET EF tool and the second one is .NET ASP code generator. So if you don't have these tools already, what you do is you go .NET tool install and minus G is for global and then you put in the name of the tool. So the first one I want is .NET hyphen EF. Now this tells me that the tool is already installed. I don't need to install it anymore. But if I want to update it, I can recall the last command and instead of install, I'm going to change it to update and this will update it to the latest version. Now the next tool that I need is for generating code, basically for scaffolding pages and scaffolding controllers and other artifacts. So I'm going to type in .NET tool install and it's going to be global and the name of this tool is .NET ASP.NET and code generator. So let's hit enter here and as I already have it, it's not going to install it again, but I may choose to update it. So I'm going to replace install with update and this will update the tool for me. Now let's start looking at some code. So I'm going to open up the application in VS Code by typing in code dot and this is VS Code. The first thing I'll do in VS Code is to create the models representing the entities that I want to work with. So in here I'm going to create a new folder and I'll just call it models and in this models folder, I'm going to create two classes. I'm going to create the team class and the player class. So these are the two classes I created. I'm going to take advantage of the new syntax where you can just put the namespace in the same line. And I'll do the same thing for the other class, which is the team class. Just get rid of this and get rid of the braces. The team class, what does it consist of? We're gonna make it really simple. I'm going to create a property and it will be a st string and this will be the team name. The next one is going to be the city. A team belongs to a city. So I'm going to do another property here. This will be string as well and I'll call the city. The next thing we'll do is maybe the same thing but for the province and I'll make the province nullable as well like all the others. And finally, we'll have the country. And again, we'll make the country nullable. Now, we're going to also say in the team that a team has multiple players. So we're going to build a relationship between the team and players. So for that relationship, we'll create another property and we'll say that this would be a list of player. Every team has a list of players. That will be nullable too. And we'll call this simply players. 
So that takes care of our team class. Now let's go to our player class. What do we have in the player class? Well, we have the primary key, which is int, and it would be player ID. The next thing is maybe we have the first name of the player. So I'll create another property. It will be string and it will be first name. Next, we do the last name similar to what we did before. String, last name. We want to have the position of the player. So I'm going to create the position like the goalie or the striker, something of that sort. So for this one, I'm going to call it position. Then this should be enough. We don't need to make it too complicated. Let's not forget to make these nullable to get rid of this warning. And let's think about the relationship between the player and the team. Every player belongs to a team. Since every player belongs to a team, we must have some sort of a team foreign key in the player entity. So this is represented by a foreign key called team name, which is also a string. And for navigation purposes, we can have another entity here of type team, and we'll just call it team. This could be nullable as well. And just to specify that this is a foreign key, I can type in foreign key here, and we'll just say that this is team name. This is not known, so I'm going to resolve it by, in the case of the map that I'm on, I would hit command dot. On Windows, it would be control dot. Now, let's go back to the team, and we have to ensure that this team name is recognized as a key. So I will annotate it with the key annotation, and this has to be resolved. We need to have a database context class. Now, to create a database context class, we should add it into a folder called data. So I'm going to create a folder called data. And in this data folder, I'm going to create a context class, which I will call application DB context. And let me use the same syntax as I did before, where the namespace is a one liner. And for this, I need to have a constructor. So I'm going to type CTOR and a tab, it will give me a constructor. Now this class needs to inherit from DB context. This has to be resolved. And my constructor, it's going to be taking as an argument a DB context options object, and it will be of type application DB context, which is the same as this class here. And parameter will be just options. This will be passed to the base class. So if I make this a little bit bigger so we can see this, I'm going to say this one, we're just gonna pass it base options to the base class. That's our constructor. Now, in addition to the fact that we have a constructor, we have to mention here that the application DB context, it caters to a list of two entities. This is done by adding another property of type DB set that acts upon team objects. And this we can call teams. We need to resolve this. So I'm going to import this namespace and we do the same thing for players. So I'm going to say DB set of player and this one I want to call it players. If you look at the warning here, it says that there is a nullable property player. So we can get rid of this warning by making these two properties nullable. It is good for a developer to have some sample data so that you can visualize how the application works. So I will create some sample data by creating a class in the data folder, which I will call seed data. I'm going to copy and paste the code for the seed data because it will take too much time to type it in. So I'll replace the seed data class with this. Let me resolve all of these namespaces first. And I think they're all resolved now. So what have we got here? I'm creating an extension method for the model builder class here. And the extension method is going to add the return from this method into the team entity and the return array from this method into the player entity. Now here I've got two methods essentially. I've got a get teams method that gives me a list of some teams and I've got the get players method that returns for me a list of players. These are sample data. So here I'm instantiating a list of team objects and I'm adding some new teams. So these are like hockey teams. So I have the Canucks, 
the city is Vancouver, the province is BC, and it's in Canada. And I have a bunch of other teams, the Sharks, the Oilers, the Flames, and so on and so forth. So that takes care of the teams. Now, as far as the players are concerned, every player belongs to a team. So here, this guy, Sven Berchi, he is with the Canucks and he's a forward player. And you have three others. So in total, we have four players belonging to different teams. So this is what the seed data class does. It just generates for me some sample data. So how do I actually add the sample data to the entities? And the answer to that is you go to the application DB context class and you add this method here. This method is the on model creating method. And this is the code where you're actually seeding the database tables with data. This model builder is being passed as an argument to this on model creating method. And we're going to call this extension method that we created, which is seed. Let's look at the rest of the logic in this on model creating. The first thing is we're calling the base class on model creating method and passing it the builder object. These are some ways of specifying rules on your various columns in the tables. For example, in the case of the team name property in the player class, we're making this required. And also the team name property, we want to set the maximum length to 30. These two commands are ways of forcing a specific name for the table in the database. So here I'm saying that I want the team table to be called team and I want the players table to be called player. If you don't do this, the default is that it will be pluralized in the database. So team would be called teams and player would be called players in the database. But I want it to be singular and this is just a matter of style. So this is how you can code into this method, specify certain rules and also seed the database with some data. I am working on a Mac and you cannot run SQL Server on a Mac. So the solution that I found is to run SQL Server in a container. So a suitable container is this one here. This is a Docker container image. So I'm using this command to start a SQL Server Docker container on my computer. Needless to say, I have Docker installed. As you can see here, I'm clicking on the whale and it's running. So I'm going to run this command and the things I want you to note are that the SA password that I'm specifying is this here, SQL password exclamation mark. Now the default port number in SQL Server is 1433. I'm mapping that to 1444 on my computer. I'm giving this container a name when it gets created. It's just going to be called AZ SQL. It's going to run as a daemon minus D and this is the actual image. So let me copy this and run it on my machine and hit enter here. So if I type in Docker PS now, it will tell you that this container has been running for four seconds. If I run it again, it says that it's been running for 12 seconds. So I know that it is actually running. Now we need to talk to this database, which means that we need to set the connection string for the database somewhere in our application. Now, the best place to do that is in the app settings file here. I will put a comma here and add the connection string. So I will paste that connection string here and you will see that, let me just expand this you will see that we create a section called connection strings. And in that section, you can have different connection strings to different databases. So this database that I want to talk to, it is going to be running locally on localhost. So this is the IP address of localhost. The port number, as I said, is 1444. And notice that for port number, you put a comma, not a colon in SQL Server. The name of the database, I will call it team players DB. The username is SA and the password is SQL password exclamation. We must somewhere tie the connection string with the database. And this is done inside of program.cs in this area here, right above builder.build. So I'm going to paste some code here. 
and this is what it looks like. Let me first resolve these namespaces and this one too. So here is the code for reading the connection string. It's being read into this variable. Here I'm getting the services and I'm adding a context to it being the application DB context. And this is where you're tying the application DB context to this connection string by saying that in the options, we're using SQL Server with this connection string. We're all set now to be able to do something called migrations. So I'm going to come to the terminal window and we're going to add some migrations. The first thing we want to do is to add a migration. And notice here, I'm going to use the utility.net EF, which we installed earlier on. And there's a command called migrations. I'm going to add a migration, which I will call M1. It's going to go into a folder under data and it will be called migrations. So if I hit enter here, it's going to create for me migrations based on the model that I have. Now let's have a look at what it actually did. So if I go into the data folder here, I can get rid of these and go into the data folder, you will see that there are a bunch of files that were created. This is the file that it just created. It created the commands for creating the team table, creating the player table, and adding the constraints like the primary keys and the foreign keys and so on. And notice that here in the player table, it has created a foreign key into the team and into the team column in the team table. This is the code for inserting team data. And this is the code for inserting player data and some code here for creating the index. So this file has basically two methods. It has the up method that creates all these artifacts and it has the down method that destroys them. So we need now to run this migration because if you go into the database, you will not find these tables created yet. This is the code for creating those tables. Now, if you want to create those tables, you go back into the terminal window and you can say .NET EF database update. And this will create for you all these artifacts in the database. And you can see here that these SQL statements are being executed. For example, this is where the data for player is being inserted. This is where the data for the teams are being inserted. So now we have this sense of confidence that our database artifacts have been created. The tables have been created. They were also seeded with sample data. You will remember that we installed two tools. One is the .NET EF tool, which we used, if you recall the last command here, this one we used before. Now we also installed another tool and it was used for code generation. Now we will use that tool to create for us the pages that we need in order to talk to these tables that were created in the database. And for the team pages, I will be running this command. So this is going to be using this utility, ASP.NET Code Generator. We want to generate a razor page based on the team model, minus DC stands for the database context class. And this is application DB context because this is the class we have here for application DB context right there. And next, the switch minus UDL is to use the default layout. The output directory for the pages that get created will be pages and under there, it will create a new folder called team pages. So if you look at our code here, we have a folder for pages. So under here, it's going to create another folder called team pages and it will put the pages in there. Finally, this minus reference script libraries it is to specify whether or not to reference script libraries in the generated views. So let's take this, copy it, and put it in the terminal window. So I'm going to paste it here. And if I run this, it's going to create for me the team player pages. Let's go into our code here. And under pages, you can see I have my team pages. And magically, it created for me the pages for creating data, for deleting data, 
for displaying details, for editing data, and also for listing the data, which is index. So let's see, there seems to be a warning here. Let's see where that warning is. It is team name and we're getting this saying it could be null. So maybe down here we can put an exclamation mark to get rid of that warning. We did the pages for team. Now let's do the same thing for player. So let me go back to my terminal window and recall the last command. Now this one I can modify it. So I'm going to modify it by changing the model to player and later it's going to create for me the pages in a folder called player pages. And if I hit enter now, it should create for me the player pages. And let's go back and look at our code. So we now have player pages and we have team pages. In the delete, there seems to be some sort of a warning. We can add an exclamation mark here to get rid of that warning. Let's see if there are others. The same thing with details. We can come here and add an exclamation mark there. And let's go to let's see if this has gone away. Yes. And then let's go to index and see if there's any warning here. We can add an exclamation right there to get rid of the warning. So now we don't have any warnings with player pages. And do we have any warnings with team pages? We don't have any here. So we're good. Let's run our application to see if it actually works. So I'm going to go .NET watch run. To get to the players pages, we need to enter slash player pages slash again, and it will get you the player pages. If I want to see my team pages, I can enter team pages, enter and I get to see my team pages. So you can see the data has actually been inserted in the database and it's being viewed in pages and we didn't do too much coding because the code generator utility helped us to create all these pages. Now it would be nice to have menu items on our home page. The way to do that is to go into the pages shared and then you have this file called layout.cshtml. So what we can do is copy one of these and paste it twice. One for the teams and the other one for the players. Now for the teams, the ASP page that we want to go to will be teams pages slash index. And we can say here teams. And for the players, I'm going to say player pages slash index again, and it should say players. I believe I made a mistake here. I put teams, it should be team pages, and this is player pages. Now, if we go back to our application, let's reload it and go back to it. And now we have our menu. If I click on team, it's going to take me to the team's pages. If I click on player, it's going to take me to the player's pages. Now let us click on teams and actually enter a team. So I'm going to enter a team. Let's say I'll put a bunch of X's here. For city, let's put Y, province, Z, and for country, A. So if I click on create, you'll see that the data has been created here. Let me add a player into this team, which I called XXXX. So go to player, create a new player. Let me call this Joe. Text position is goalie. And you will notice here that we get a drop down list. So the navigation between the player and the team has already been established. So I get a drop down list. If I click on create, there you go, Joe Tex belongs to this XXX team. And of course, the edit, the details, and the delete, they all work. So let me just edit this, change the name to Tom, save, and this has been changed to Tom. Let's look at the details, go back to the list, and then delete, and it all works. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please give it the thumbs up. And until we meet in the next video, take care.